I'm inclined to say that there is actually no evidence for evolution. He's been called by Tom Wolfe, one of our most brilliant essayists. He's worked in the nation's capital as a journalist for some of America's top political magazines. And he has spent his career raising provocative questions about evolution that many others are afraid to touch. The great problem with science as it is understood today is that authority more and more replaces evidence. The scientists themselves love that, of course, because it means you can't question them. But the fact is that we should be questioning them in everywhere they go, because the whole notion of science is that it should be open to the idea of questioning the claims that you make. My name is Tom Bethel. I'm a journalist. I grew up in England and I went to uh, Oxford University. And in fact, I was at Oxford University at the same time as Richard Dawkins. Tom Bethel studied philosophy at Oxford and it was there, as a young man, that he first began wondering whether Darwinian evolution was actually true. And I remember looking at the title page of Darwin's famous book on the origin of species by means of natural selection and he goes on or the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life and I was thinking the preservation of favored races how do we know which ones are favored and it turns out that it's the ones that are preserved so the whole thing is sort of circular after receiving his degree at Oxford Bethel came to the United States he started out working as a teacher, but soon found his way into the occupation where he would remain for the rest of his life. I first came to America because I was interested in jazz, and I moved to New Orleans because I was interested in traditional jazz. And then after I'd been there for a few years, I was offered a job in Washington, D.C. to work for the Washington Monthly as a reporter or as a journalist. So I came here in 1975, and I've been here ever since. Bethel met his wife Donna in Washington, D.C., where they still reside. Over his journalistic career, he served as a writer and contributing editor for numerous publications, including Harper's and The American Spectator. He established himself as an incisive political commentator, but his journey towards scientific skepticism of Darwin had just begun. After I left Oxford, the whole subject kind of faded a little bit from my mind for a while until I came across this book by Norman Macbeth called Darwin Retried. A Harvard-trained lawyer, Macbeth published Darwin Retried in 1971. He was a lawyer in New York, near Manhattan, and he introduced me to some of the people at the American Museum of Natural History and they helped me understand the whole issue. As a journalist, it would be unpopular in most publications, questioning Darwinism. But as it happened, I worked for a magazine for a while, Harper's, where the editor was happy to question anything, really. Bethel's first article raising questions about Darwin was titled Darwin's Mistake. It was published by Harper's in 1976, and it provoked fierce reactions, including one from famed evolutionary biologist and Harvard professor Stephen Jay Gould. Bethel decided to use the opportunity to ask Gould for an interview. I wrote him a letter. We didn't have email in those days. That was pre-email. And he said, yes, I could come and interview him. So I went to Harvard and interviewed him. Gould suggested that Bethel also talk with one of his Harvard colleagues, geneticist Richard Lewinton. Lewinton and Gould were both very much in agreement on Darwinism, but Lewinton raised questions about the whole thing that I have never seen anybody else do, you know. He raised questions about natural selection that I thought were outstandingly interesting, and Lewinton raised a whole lot of the same issues that I had been thinking about. Later, Bethel met with Harvard evolutionary biologist E.O. Wilson. 
he's one of the just about the world expert on ants, I think. And he has a whole thing in his office where wired off where these ants are patrolling around. And uh, just incredibly interesting. He was very good on to telling you what, what they were. He's a committed Darwinian, unfortunately, but uh, a great uh, biologist. For decades, Bethel continued investigating the debate over evolution for Harper's and other publications, drawing on his discussions with some of science's top thinkers. In addition to interviewing Harvard professors like Lewinton and Wilson, he talked with influential biologists Gareth Nelson and Norman Platnick at the American Museum of Natural History, leading paleontologist Colin Patterson at London's Natural History Museum, and renowned philosopher of science Karl Popper. Again and again, he found that some of the contemporary science's leading lights had strong reservations about major aspects of Darwin's theory. Now, Popper's great claim to fame in the realm of science was his claim that theories had to be falsifiable. You had to be some experiment you could do which could show them to be wrong. Popper made the important claim that theory had to be falsifiable if it was to be considered to be scientific. And he said that as far as he could see, Darwin's theory was an unfalsifiable theory. He came under a lot of pressure in England, I think, for essentially repudiating Darwin so openly like that. And he then went back on what he had said and thought, well, maybe it's falsifiable. Maybe it is a scientific theory. And so then he was at the Hoover Institution for a week, so I went and interviewed him and asked him about natural selection, was it a falsifiable theory? And had he changed his mind? And uh, he told me, no, I have not changed my mind. It's the same, as, it's a, a feeble theory. It doesn't amount to anything. The more Bethel talked with the experts, the more skeptical he became about Darwinian theory. The main problem with Darwinism is the whole idea of natural selection is circular. You can't find a criterion of fitness that is independent of survival. So it's the survival of the survivors. Bethel grants that there is evidence of small amounts of evolutionary change in nature, which is known as microevolution. But he doesn't think there is convincing evidence that one kind of organism can evolve into a completely different kind of organism. Bacteria have remained bacteria and have never become anything else. Ants have remained ants, and although they're incredibly complicated. Now, we do observe microevolution, but what they find is more like reversion to the mean. Reversion to the mean describes an observation made by animal breeders. If a dog breeder selects for certain traits, perhaps for larger ears or a shorter nose, they will see changes over time. But if the dogs with the exaggerated traits are released into the wild, their offspring eventually tend to revert back to the characteristics of their ancestors. This is completely contrary to the idea of evolution, I think. It shows that we basically stay the same, not that we gradually on the, on the way to becoming something else. Even if large-scale evolution did occur in the history of life, Bethel says there is no evidence such changes could have been produced by a blind process. It is true that we have fossils of creatures that no longer exist, but fossils can't tell us whether the process that produced these extinct organisms were based on random variations like Darwin proposed. When I first came to America, there used to be these what I think thought of as automobile graveyards. There would be fields with whole stacks of cars just packed together in one field. But they're like fossils, really. And you could say there's some fossils. But every single one of those cars was designed. So they were all intelligently designed. The fact that you have fossils of organisms does not demonstrate that they came about by pure random means. In fact, organisms are far more complicated than automobiles. So that doesn't get you anywhere in trying to prove or to demonstrate that Darwinism has some truth to it. Bethel notes that Darwinism has strong ties to the discredited Victorian idea of inevitable universal progress. The whole notion of progress is built into Darwin, Darwin's theory. 
Darwin himself would be the first to agree, we have to start with something very simple and we build up to these more and more complicated organisms. He is incorporating the idea of progress in coming to this conclusion. Now, if you talk about is, is the human race progressing or, are, or do we believe in the whole theory of progress, a lot of people will tell you, no, we don't believe in that. We're humans are rotten, you know, we're no good. So, this is one reason why I think skepticism about evolutionism has really grown and increased because we don't believe in progress anymore. After a lifetime of raising questions with his readers and with some of the world's leading scientists, Bethel decided to write a book that would draw together the various strands of the evolution debate and place them in context. The result is Darwin's House of Cards. When I first began looking into this, there was, no, there was very little public questioning of evolution or Darwinism at all. But it was in the 1960s that I first really started to look at it and question it. And the books that have since come out that have questioned it, especially books by people like Michael Behe, Darwin's Black Box was the name of his best known book. They didn't come out till the 1990s or later. So there was a long period of growing dissent about the theory. And I had felt that dissent myself since I first started to think about it. It just couldn't possibly be true. How did we get from bacteria to the incredibly complex creatures that human beings are? How did bacteria themselves first appear? How did life first appear? None of these questions have ever been answered. So I thought, well, the time has come to write a book about it. Bethel hopes his book might open minds about Darwin's theory. We're allowed to be skeptical of, in so many fields, but we're not really allowed to be skeptical about scientific claims. So what is happening is that authority is replacing evidence to a greater and greater degree. And that, I think, getting clear on that is one of the things that I have learned from my uh, exploration of Darwinian evolution.